Hello everyone, my name is Jonah Comstock and I'm the Director of Content Development at HIMSS Media. Welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar, Leveraging Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning to Extract Real-World Insights from Population-Scale Clinical Lab Data, sponsored by AWS, Databricks, and Prognos. During today's webinar, you'll learn how Prognos built a set of automated data pipelines and over 12,000 custom machine learning algorithms on the Databricks Unified Data Analysis sorry, on the Databricks Unified Data Analytics platform on Amazon Web Services. You will also hear about the sophisticated way Prognos refines, standardizes, and enriches clinical lab data, and how to streamline data pipelines while maintaining flexibility and control over workflows as needed. Our speakers today are Frank Austin Notaft, Technical Director of Healthcare and Life Sciences at Databricks, and Adam Petronovich, Chief Data Scientist at Prognos. With that, I'll hand it over to Frank to begin the presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jonah. So, hi, so I'm Frank Notaft. I'm the Technical Director for Healthcare and Life Sciences at Databricks. Uh, in my role, I help our customers across the world to analyze large-scale healthcare and life sciences data sets. Uh, in today's talk, we'll uh, jump into what, uh, first we'll do a quick overview of the Databricks platform, and then we'll jump into an overview of what Prognos, uh, Prognos does. Using, uh, using some of the world's largest lab data sets and how they're using the Databricks platform to, to look at this data. They'll talk about some of the applications of the machine learning models that they've built out, and then they'll walk through the architecture that they've built out for analyzing this data on the Amazon Web Services cloud using both AWS and Databricks services. At the end, we'll take some of the audience questions. For us, uh, Databricks is a company um, the way that we look at the way that we look at large scale data is that many people are struggling to get their data science teams, their data engineering teams, and their business teams to read off the same script when they're working with large data products. What we try to do to solve this is we've built out a unified data analytics platform that allows all of these teams to efficiently work together and accelerate the sort of analyses that they're running so that they can take a large scale data set and rapidly turn that into business insights. The way that we've done this is by building on top of popular open source libraries such as Apache Spark. Our team, uh, the co-founding team of our Databricks company were the, were the six people, the four grad students and the two faculty who built the Apache Spark project at UC Berkeley. In the time since we open sourced, uh, open sourced Apache Spark and started Databricks in 2013, we've grown to be a global company with over 5,000 customers and 450 partners, and have introduced several other new machine learning and uh, new machine learning and data management open source projects, such as Delta Lake and MLflow. Delta Lake is a tool that allows people to very efficiently manage large-scale data using cloud-native storage techniques, while MLflow is an end-to-end -end system for tracking and managing machine learning models as they go through the machine learning lifecycle. As we see customers put these together, we see them able to tackle some of the, some of the really big and really hard to, hard to manage problems, such as what Prognos is doing with the world's largest collection of lab data. When we look at, when we look at customers like, like Prognos, what we see is that many people are trying to use real-world evidence to go ahead and understand how patients, uh, how patients are interacting with medicine, how patients' conditions are faring in the real world. Many of these, uh, you know, we see huge, huge uh, areas for application in the healthcare system, where companies are able to take, uh, you know, they're able to take this real-world data to understand how patients are, how patients are faring in, uh, you know, in, in daily practice, to understand how, um, how patients' lived experience, the, you know, their exposure to their exposure to conditions, their behaviors, are impacting their total disease risk. We also see a lot of work, both in the pharmaceutical industry as well as in the healthcare space, to understand the true value of various different interventions and to take a very empirical look at the, at the value of, a, uh, of using a certain therapeutic or putting a patient into a specific care stream. They can really understand how these, uh, how these methods of care are, are changing a patient's biomarkers and how they're actually ultimately changing an individual's condition. And we can also get a great understanding of the adverse events caused by different treatment paths, as well as the actual, the actual real-world usage patterns of people, uh, people who are taking, uh, taking various medicines. When we look across our, across our customer base, we see many different areas that this comes up. We see plenty of applications for this in the pharmaceutical, uh, in the pharmaceutical sector, where people are using real-world evidence data assets to get better insight into how patients are Patients are taking therapeutics to understand how 
uh, how we can more effectively uh, advertise to and identify patients that are good candidates for, for a therapeutic, and so that we can better build uh, the correct population uh, uh, the correct population of trial sites and per, uh, personalities and uh, inclusion exclusion criteria that we should use when running a trial. We see a lot of use cases across the provider space where people are integrating these real world evidence data assets to build population, uh, population oriented risk models that predict disease outcomes. And we see a lot of use for this in the payment space where, uh, where health plans are able to better evaluate the efficacy of various different treatments Recommend, uh, recommend people to various different treatment and care pathways, and optimize the end-to-end -end care that an individual receives. But, uh, but while many people see opportunities to use real-world evidence, many people, are still, um, many people are struggling to actually turn this into production. About 90% of the people that we talk to are planning to, to conduct studies that use real-world evidence data sets, and about 60% of these studies have a strong machine learning component. But when we look at how, how this is turned into how this is turned into practice, only about 50% of people who have uh, who have started to invest in these real-world evidence studies have the capabilities to analyze the large scale and variety of data uh, data that comes in a standard real-world uh, you know comes in a standard real-world data set. When we look at the actual success that people are achieving, we see that in spite of this, only one in every third project are becoming successful. And we see many different reasons for this. You know, this is a um, you know this is a, a chart that looks at all the various different uh, all the various different aspects that are involved in building out a uh, a machine learning system on a large scale data set. And this comes from a Google paper that came out at at uh, the NIPS conference back in 2015. While this while this paper talked about what has to happen in terms of building a general purpose compute system, we see a lot of parallels between this and working with real world evidence data. People struggle heavily with, uh, with configuring their systems to point to their real-world assets and loading, these data, uh, loading this data set in uh, so that they can query it at very large scale. A lot of customers struggle, uh, struggle with putting together the, the, um, the code necessary to verify, uh, to verify the data that they have and to make sure that it matches up with the inclusion-exclusion criteria and other, other phenotype-based criteria that they need in their study. When it comes to processing these large data sets and maybe tens of terabytes in size or more, machine resource management is a big problem as we're asking teams of biostatisticians and PhD level machine learning scientists to spin up large clusters and manage their own IT and DevOps, which may be foreign to them. When we look at machine learning, we see many issues that are kind of downstream of the machine learning code, such as how do I go ahead and extract the features? How do I analyze the performance of my model? And then how do I log and, and turn all of the models that I'm building into a production system? So we see all of these different barriers come together to make it hard for people to work on their real-world evidence data assets. And inside of Databricks, what we try to do is we try to build a system that runs on top of your AWS cloud to help you, uh, help you achieve these problems, uh, help you address these problems in a much more rapid fashion so that you can quickly turn that real-world evidence data that you have into, into, a, uh, into an outcome that you can push into either into the hands of your clinical system or push into the hands of people who are managing your clinical trials and your other commercial activities. We look at this as a kind of a three-level tier. We have an enterprise cloud service that runs in your AWS account that uh, makes it very easy to manage compute. We couple this with a unified data service that allows you to scale up to many terabytes to petabytes of data with high performance. And then we have a managed data science workspace that allows you to very efficiently collaborate, uh, very efficiently collaborate across across analyses as you go through engineering, data science, and then pushing your results to individuals. We look at how customers have leveraged this. One of our large biopharmaceutical customers had been spinning up a large real-world evidence data activity inside of uh, inside of their compute cluster, and they were actually losing about seventy-five thousand dollars a month because they had to they had to teach their PhDs their PhD level researchers, how to manage and administer the, the system themselves. So they were actually running about six months behind the project. They were spending about $75,000 a month in outage costs. When they moved to the Databricks platform, by using our point and click UI to spin up resources, they were immediately able to get access to compute, and they were able to spin up and run their project very rapidly and get their first results out in just a matter of weeks. When we then go up to our unified data service, we provide a highly optimized Spark service that couples with our Delta Lake storage engine to make it so you can efficiently run ETL 
while uh, abstracting away many of the problems around data pipeline reliability and making data accessible to a large number of, uh, large number of individuals. Some of our customers have seen their ETL pipelines for their real-world evidence drop from about a week's time so that they can run in under four hours. And then when we get to the data science workspace, we provide a collaborative notebook-based experience so that many users can share notebooks and collaborate within a single notebook at the same time. With that being said, I'll go ahead and transition over to Adam Petronovich, who is the Chief Data Scientist at Prognos, who will go ahead and talk about the work that they have done on real-world evidence data using the AWS Cloud and the Databricks platform. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, so first of all, hello, everyone. My name is Adam Petronovich. I'm the Chief Data Scientist for Prognos. Um, and before I'd like to kind of get into who Prognos is, what we do, talk about Databricks, talk about um, some of the applications, to kind of tell everyone where I'm coming from. And um, gosh, what was it? Seven years ago, eight years ago, I got my first job as a data scientist. Um, and it's a big data company. We're talking four terabytes of data generated every day at this company. This was an ad tech. Um, and for those of you that are unfamiliar with ad tech, it's really truly the big data environment. And I'm, I'm excited, right? I'm ready to do some math. It's like day one, I show up to work, I've got my laptop, and here we go, folks. I'm going to do some analysis. Welcome to the big data world. So I get there and say, well, Adam, uh, first of all, your, your local machine is not going to be big enough. Um, obviously, you're going to need to spin up a cluster or spin up your own VM. Uh, okay, great. How do I do that? Well, we, have our, we manage our own clusters. We manage our own um, hardware here. And we did that for good reason. But you're going to need to log into this application. And do it. I said, okay, I'm going to log into this application. Completely custom application. Um, they made it themselves, and it's beautiful. It's great, but I had to learn this technology. What type of box do I want? And it was like so many options. I remember being like, how many cores do I want? I don't know. I don't know what type of analysis I'm going to do this time. Uh, what what authoriza authorizations are you going to need? Man, I, I don't know. Um, all, all of them? Maybe? Okay, cool. Um, so I get the box, right? And that was days of work going back and forth um, with, with our uh, sysops uh, to have, you know, get my box. And then I said, okay. Now you got to configure it because you actually want to do data analysis. Uh, okay. Well, first you need all your authorizations. You need all your environment variables. You need um, everything that connects to our vertical clusters to connect to a Hadoop clusters. Um, you need to set that all up. Uh, okay. And that's days of work. And it's me pinging our, our tech teams back over and over again. Hey, it's not working. Hey, it's not working. Some help. Um, I, I was almost ready to donate a kidney just to get my box set up. And then it's like, okay. Um, uh, excuse me. Um, okay, great. Um, uh, the uh, now I need now I actually want to do some research, right? I need to install all the libraries, all the preferred libraries, everything I need to actually start building plots, uh, and then I need to and then I'm ready to do work. And it was like weeks worth of work until I got to set up um, a box, right? And then I can even start doing analysis. Um, and it was so frustrating. And then I get all my analysis done, and I'm like, it's time to share. Okay, okay, great. Uh, can, can you visit this link? Uh, no. Okay, well, let me put it as a PowerPoint. Uh, send it then. Okay, we want to move into production. Uh, Adam, uh, what type of Python did you use? I was on 3.1. Oh, sorry, Adam. Our production uh, system has 2.7. Uh, you're going to have to rewrite everything. And it was crushing. And we got into this process of essentially ask for hardware, set up authorizations, then you, I was doing more time doing tech ops um, than I was actually doing research. Um, and it turned out that just moving research into production took a whole army. And it was so funny. So this is not a small team. This is a team of 30 data scientists. It was an over 1,000 person company. And we, we got back this dog ate my homework answer. Uh, Adam, is the analysis done this week? Uh, no, sorry, my dev box is down. Or I'm, I'm having problems. I'm having dev box issues. Or my environment's not configured. I can't turn it in. And, you know, the more time I spend in this field, uh, the more, uh, next slide here, the more I realize that this is not an uncommon story. Uh, I feel that 50% of development research time is setting up hardware, configuring environments, connecting the data sources. And then, you know, if you manage your own source, if, you, if you're actually managing your own servers or worrying about that, that type of stuff, you have to take them down. It's just so much overhead. And then the, the effort of authentication. Um, you know, I work for a company now that, that deals with, obviously, P2P 
PHI and HIPAA compliance, and we have a lot uh, of authorizations and authentications that are required to do business here. We could not manage that without, without uh, a massive tech team. And how really Prognos has used um, uh, Databricks is, is really the centralized glue between our teams. It's not just used by my, by my data science team. It's used by engineering, it's used by QA, and it's used by our clinical analyst teams. And so now that you kind of know where I'm coming from and, and the personal frame point and why I was so excited to come and speak to you about Databricks and, and, and the Amazon, um, I want to kind of tell you about Prognos. You know, who are we? And what do we do? And so, first of all, let's just start with our mission. Um, we really want to improve health by driving the best actions learned from the world's data. We are truly a data-driven company. Uh, we were founded about eight years ago by two cousins, uh, Sandeep and Jason Vaughn. And, and uh, Jason was a medical doctor, an MD, and you know, he, he would be uh, seeing 30 or 40 patients a day. He says, I can do more. I want to do more. And his, and his cousin, the serial entrepreneur is like, hey, there's got to be something we can do to fix this. Um, and they realized just that the laboratory data and the laboratory market was very silent. Um, these large national labs had um, a very, I would say, unique ways of doing it. It was, it was, if your blood test results are with one lab, it was impossible to get to another lab. Doctors had to log into all these different servers. It was a mess. So we kind of started out as a data aggregator. We were bringing in and bringing in more and more data. Uh, we eventually started uh, getting a lot of traction, becoming funded. As you hear, you can see some of our key partners and our investors. We are a VC-backed firm. Uh, Sigma uh, is a, a safeguard, and Merck are all investors in us. And we work with a broad range of clients, from uh, life sciences to payers and underwriters to labs themselves. And about three years ago, uh, we said, wow, we're really sitting on this massive data asset. And to really talk about how large it is, it is the largest cross-lab clinical data set in the world. Uh, we have de-identified laboratory data on 250 million U.S. patients that is linked to claims and Rx data, as well as their laboratory records. Um, and what we do is that we, is it, what this ultimately amounts to is about 27 billion individual lab test results. Uh, and these are everything from A1C globes, the A A1C scores, the hemoglobin scores, to um, really rare disease, to, to oncology things. Um, and this picture is, uh, we're unveiling it for the first time uh, in, uh, in this presentation. But uh, uh, you can see here is that this is kind of a really that summarizes our process and our pipeline, is that we take all of these very unique different sources, we standardize uh, the field, standardize the, um, uh, the, the, the test results, uh, clean up the records, put everything in an actual usable format. I think people often overlook how much effort goes into data prep cleaning organization. Uh, we have an AI uh, and machine learning effort in team. We have a huge clinical and expertise team. And we have eventually comes out with a self uh, schema imposed, feel harmonized, real time cloud offering of all of this data that's been de-identified, but able to be linked to patients and their claims in Rx data, uh, claims in uh, lab data. And so what do we do with this? We do a lot of things. Um, so uh, first off, once you have this clean data set, you're able to kind of look at a manual decision type approach or human type logic, right? So these are what we call our clinical truths. And these are essentially diagnoses. These are when doctors and clinicians look at the, um, the patient record and say, hey, this patient has these ICD-10 codes and uh, with this test result and this test result within this range, they have Gaucher's or they have um, uh, some onco oncological events. Um, but we also now have a lot of predictive capabilities where we essentially let machine learning and matrix algebra at scale figure out the diagnosis um, uh, and the, the risk uh, of these patients. And so how do people really use this test? And within the payers and the underwriters market, um, they really use it in terms of predicting patient risk and predicting patient cost. Uh, they use it to predict uh, high cost conditions and forecast the, um, the cost or the risk of a group of patients moving in the forward. Um, and actually, the uh, case that I'm going to give later today is going to be directly this, uh, uh, this use case. Um, our life sciences companies, these are the 
Bayer's, these are the Merck's, the, the, you know, the, these large companies use um, us to essentially discover new biomarkers to help predict disease. Um, we, they use our technology to help map patient journey to detect disease earlier. And then also identify health providers or patients themselves that um, are required for new treatments um, and that may be available for new tests, new drugs. And then diagnostic companies themselves. So these are the lab cores, the Quest, and the genomics, essentially using our um, uh, technology to help standardize and organize the data itself. We have a large NLP effort here uh, at Prognos where we take raw doctor's notes, anatomical pathology, molecular diagnostic reports. We throw them through these really awesome convolutional neural nets um, and able to extract diagnosis, able to extract features like organ, site, subsite. Is it progressioning? Is it worsening? Um, and then all powered by this tech. Um, and so, once again, Databricks is the glue. Um, Databricks and really AWS allow us to power all of these efforts across not only data science but other teams. So the data science team, we're over 25 data scientists from a variety of STEM, STEM backgrounds. Uh, we use uh, the, the Databricks platform on AWS, everything from exploratory research to uh, feature creation to data visualization. Um, and it's becoming um, uh, a language that the, the what actually what I've seen is as I'm hiring and I'm bringing people on board, people that haven't experienced the platform pick it up really quick. Um, and most of them are, are, are pretty blown away that, hey, when I need a you know, 10 terabyte cluster to attach to a notebook, I can easily do that and get it running in a couple of minutes and then, and then start doing analysis within the same day of being hired. Um, if you would have told me that 10 years ago when I'm, when I'm at this ad tech company, I would have been, I would have been shocked. I was like, that's, that's crazy. Um, engineers use, uh, use all these services as well. It helps with algorithm development. Um, also, when they're building ETL pipelines, the, the, uh, a lot of things that we do on the back end are Spark-based. Um, our clinical analysts use it for condition research. And these are generally uh, people that have some technical background. But the, the UI, the visualization, to be able to graph tests and see what's going on with very simple code and connect to a cluster and access our data, it's become a UI and an interface them to even do research themselves. Um, and the thing that people usually forget all the time when building algorithms is how to QA and monitor the thing when it's out in the wild. Um, we use uh, the AWS and Databricks platform for algorithmic monitoring as well. Uh, and now I kind of want to get a little bit more detailed into what we really do here and give you some, uh, some examples of, of the tech. Um, first and foremost, data exploration. Um, it, it's ideally what you're doing as most of your time um, as, as a data scientist. Um, we have over 1,500 algorithms that are unique that we've discovered over time to flag, clean, and um, uh, organize uh, the data. And it's everything from uh, simple, uh, you know, if and or statements, you know, some sort of uh, S expression to something very complex and of executing a, an inference of, a, of an AI neural network uh, on, on the data itself. But it all starts at the, um, at really being able to, uh, within a Databricks uh, notebook. And they all start the same as I'm going to attach a cluster to a work environment. And then I can go in there and log into my team page. I can log into a, a, a clean, uh, uh, an engineering folder, and I can already attach the libraries and the dependencies I need to this cluster. I'll uh, become so ephemeral and replicable, um, it, it moves so quickly, and we're able to share research so quickly. Um, and what's great is that we're able to spin up of arbitrary size, and when we're done using it, it goes away. Um, you know, when we have these really large jobs, as many of us know, that take a long time, that are very computationally intensive, you know, you don't need that cluster all the time. Um, and so being able to take it down quickly and even setting a, 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 a time for it to go away if it's in use is exceedingly helpful. Um, and then everything's, once again, Git version control. Um, and so when we need to track changes, and often some of us, like me, forget to commit and push, the next thing I know, I'm, I'm like, oh, my gosh, where's the bug? Where do I need to go back? It's, it's done on the fly with these notebooks. It's very helpful uh, when you're trying to do uh, research. And so kind of show you some of these visualizations. These interactive notebooks are so useful for me and my team. Um, it supports a variety of visualizations. Um, 
you know, you, I know many uh, uh, data scientists that are ninjas with Matplotlib, and I have been one of them. But most of the time, I don't need to do something overly complex. I just need to see a quick, little, you know, some quick uh, distribution, maybe a quick uh, spark line. Uh, we use these uh, visualizations in the notebook all the time, um, and they're so shareable across the team. If I see something that's in interesting, I just, you know, let my teammate know. He's able to go in the Daybricks UI, go in, and he's going to spin up his own cluster, go in and see my notebook and see my research, and, and ideally find the bugs that I just introduced. <laughs> um, but also, we use this uh, pretty heavily for algorithmic monitoring and QA. Um, and so, uh, whenever we have uh, a new algorithm go out into the wild, we always set up live monitoring. We need to know what's going on. Um, and the Databricks UI and the alerting system allows us to essentially say, look, um, we are always monitoring this. If something comes up, we see a report, we actually get pushes to our emails through this. We're able to log, log into a notebook. The notebook's already running with the up visualization. We, we see what's going on. Um, it's been incredibly helpful for us to our teams um, in, in understanding what's going on. And, and really for the rest of the talk, I want to give you a, a detailed case study of, of an algorithm that we use that really leverages um, um, the AWS stack and that, that, that we've used Databricks to kind of solve. And so first, I kind of want to introduce the problem here. And this is uh, within our payers vertical or underwriting. So the challenge is, is a following. Uh, given a set of N patients, predict, uh, predict set I, uh, I relative future cost against the population's average cost. So what we're saying is, look, we have all of these patients. I'm randomly going to tell you, you know, a set of N of them. I need you to tell me if these patients are more expensive or less expensive than, uh, than the population average. And what this comes into is underwriting, right? So saying if I am a payer, um, uh, one of these large insurance companies, they say, I need to know if this pool of patients has, is relatively less risky or more risky, um, and really in terms of cost than the engine. And what's interesting is that we will only know the, the, the patients uh, at time of request. So there's an element of having to be able to pre-process things and then be able to run things quickly on the fly. Um, and what we really want to say, look, uh, we want to be able to give a response to this client uh, within less than one minute. So um, this is when we got to kind of do the really cool stuff and the things that, that I love most in the, the predictive modeling. Now the data that we're working with is panel data, some call it longitudinal data. So each patient, uh, it's sequence data, right? So each patient will have many records over the course of their history. Um, essentially, they'll have, um, you know, a test. You can think of it as a test result being each row in our database. And, and some data, some uh, patients have no test results. They haven't been tested. Some have many. Um, and because of the scale of this and that we were able to collect claims data on millions of people, we said, look, this is a clear application of, of AI. Uh, specifically, um, let's try RNNs. Um, you know, everyone's favorite thing to start with is an LSTM RNN. It makes a lot of sense in this um, so that we can actually show the time temporal progression of a patient's health over time. So we set up all these RNNs, we were training it, um, and uh, we started predicting patient costs, and it was good, but then we said, well, okay, let's not assume that data scientists know everything. Let's meet with our clinicians and see if they can help out and maybe do some manual feature engineering. And we spent some time with them and they said, hey, well, you know, here are the codes for transplants. These are generally very expensive things. Or, here, here are the um, codes for uh, hemophilia or other, um, or other conditions, but generally high cost conditions. And when we, when we added that vector into the learned vector representation uh, of a patient's journey, it really improved performance. And I guess the main takeaway is that I'm, I'm pleased to report that the machines haven't won yet. Uh, we still have jobs, and, we, and, and we've, we're still needed to do, uh, to do complex work. And so the modeling approach ultimately was a wide and deep modeling approach for this. So um, the, 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 essentially, you, you have uh, an RNN LSTM 
that uh, is trained on cost and predicts to a single cost value. Um, then what we would do is we'd take the last layer of the neural network, the last layer of neural network, and we ended up making that 128 element uh, vector. And we would concatenate that with a clinical, um, uh, with a clinically derived vector of manually engineered features uh, of those patients. And then we would run that through a secondary model. So to really kind of uh, definitively step through it, we used a combination of, of manual learned features. The learned features, 128 element, uh, 128 element embedding with uh, using RNN bidirectional LSTM frameworks. Uh, we have over 100 manual features uh, that are leveraging clinical expertise. These are LOIC codes, ICD codes, high cost conditions. Um, and then all of these member level, and these are talking the individual level features, are run through a GLM, really just a final layer, to predict cost. But that's only part of the picture. If, if we remember the original problem, we said, well, that's one person's cost. What's everyone's cost so for, for a, an arbitrary group of N people? And so we won't know um, uh, what the, uh, the final group of patients that we need to predict their costs are until the submission of what we call a roster. And so at prediction time, we need to be able to do a little bit more math. Um, and ultimately, that, that last little bit of math was a uh, gradient-boosted machine that would allow us to take the individual predictions, add a little bit more features uh, at the group level, and then output a prediction so a set of N patients, their average cost will be X. <clears throat> and so because of that, there's some implementation implications. Uh, <laughs> implementation implications. I, I love that title. Um, so, uh, so individual level predictions and the feature generation for all the individual stuff uh, can be stored and can looked up at time. Um, when you're generating uh, predictions and processing um, billions of data points and you're, you have 200, oh, actually now over 230 million patients stored, um, uh, what we do is we instantly do that every week. So every week, we take all of our laboratory data and we feature engineer, we prepare, and we set up so we essentially have a, we're all ready for the final execution step. Um, the second stage of the model is evaluated at time of request. Um, and so what's interesting about this is that these are humans using this API. We don't know when it's going to come in, uh, uh, if it's going to be bursty, if there's going to be a lot of requests really quickly, if there's only going to be a couple requests. So you need to make a fairly flexible system with this. Um, and because of this, we made a lot of uh, really key architecture decisions when rolling out this pipeline. Um, first off, huge fan of uh, SageMaker. Um, we've been using SageMaker as our deep learning framework um, for a while now. Uh, it offers a lot of things to us that we find pretty, pretty, pretty nice. Uh, we can put in custom Docker, uh, Docker containers. So whenever we need something, a, a specific implementation of something, uh, I believe we're using PyTorch now more than TensorFlow for, the, uh, for, for a lot of our models. Um, so it's been very easy to upgrade, move things in and out. Um, and GPU accelerated hosts, everything runs faster uh, when you have more processing power. Uh, all of our ETL is done through Scala Spark and almost all of our pre-processing. Um, so this is taken, actually, it's really interesting. Um, uh, when we were developing it, obviously a lot of the data science team also develops the uh, pre-processing and the, the feature engineering. Um, when you pass it off to the engineers, it went remarkably smooth. Um, we had, uh, you know, essentially a couple sit-downs with the engineering team. We walked them through our notebooks and said, hey, this is great, perfect. And, you know, I, show me what cluster is on. Show me all the prerequisites that it was required to run this cluster. Like, hey, here's the config file, as you see, and it went very smoothly. Um, now, what's in interesting here is we started using a technology called S3 Select, um, and we didn't quite need um, web services speed for this. Um, the clients that we're working with said, hey, it's okay if things are done in really a minute or two. We don't necessarily need them at time of click. And we said, okay. We can actually save a lot of money if our uh, data is actually stored in S3 um, and all of, our, um, all of our predictions, features, our managed stuff in S3, and then we use S3 Select to quickly um, um, pull in uh, the required data. 
And here's something that, that, that um, and then our final solution was to actually implement and inference the final layer of the model through Amazon Lambda. And uh, I don't know very many people are that are using Amazon Lambda in this way, but it allows us to really go to a serverless architecture. What does that mean? It means that we were able to only use the CPU resources at the time it was required to do the task. Um, now, the Amazon Lambda was able to fit in our GBM model. Um, it did take some coaxing to fit it in, but we were able to fit that, that final execution later within the Lambda. Um, and it scales with bursts. So it was really it allowed us to say, look, if whether there's one request coming in or like 30 requests coming in or 50 requests coming in, um, we can handle it um, all at once. Um, and, it, and it scales really effortlessly. Um, and it was just really cool to see that Amazon Lambda was capable of really executing ML models on the fly at, at an arbitrary scale. Um, and so I wanted to kind of walk through what the, uh, what the architecture is here. Um, so you can see we essentially have an offline ETL flow and then really an online at, at time of processing. And so our offline, all of our data here is stored in S3 data lake. Really, the, uh, it's all in Parquet files. Um, we use, uh, for our ETL process, really a structured streaming Spark cluster on EC2 that goes through once a week, goes through, does all of the pre-processing uh, of the data, makes the member level predictions, and organizes it ready for, um, for essentially for, for execution, ready for scoring. And then it sits in that S3 bucket for that week. Um, and then you have this step processing workflow. So anytime a client will say, here's a list of, of 10 patients, tell me what their predicted cost is, they hit uh, our, our API, um, instantly the Amazon Lambda steps in, is able to fetch uh, the feature vector, um, it predicts the RNN features and generates that clinical embedding, it predicts the set score, so being able to say, look, of this set, this is what we think the actual prediction is going to be. And then it repairs and returns the result. Um, and this is all done. I think when we're live, this is the talking 40 seconds here. Um, and it's been able to really effortlessly scale. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it's been great. It really has been. Um, and then at, at the end of the day, what has all of this done? You know, really the pairing of Databricks and AWS has shortened our development cycle. Um, I was new to Databricks coming to Prognos, and I've definitely uh, been such a fan of just making my day easier. <laughs> doing easier, easier. And it's also easy to train up my team. Um, it's really reduced the overhead of big data environments. Um, I've spent so much of my career worrying about cluster sizes, worrying about boxes, setting things up, getting really good at, you know, all right, here's my, uh, uh, really good at debugging Unix stuff, um, really good at finding out and checking, oh, is it your Python path? Here, let me show you with that. Um, it removes all that DevOps stuff and, and lets me kind of focus on stuff that I'm, that I'm better at. Um, and, and now my team feels less siloed with these solutions. And so when people log in, we log into the same UI and we're able to see each other's work. Uh, we're able to share notebooks, share code. Um, engineering is able to push out versions very quickly and have all the different versions there for us. So if we want to back, back a version or go up a version, it's very easy for us to do that. Um, and we're able to fine tune really how much resources we need. You know, um, a lot of times you're like, how, how big is the cluster that I need? I don't know. Um, with a lot of the back end tooling of this, it allows me to help understand the amount of CPU and memory I really need to, to, to accomplish the task. Um, it's made everything go smoother when I go from development into productionization. Um, uh, often I feel that within our teams, it's like data science finishes, then we hand it over to engineering and just wipe our hands with it and just say, all right, good luck, good luck figuring it out. Um, being able to pass them an environment that scales and understanding with them and help them support it has made things made handoffs really quick. Um, we were able to go from finalized research to implementation in less than a month uh, in a lot of these projects, which has been, I mean, it's just, to me, it's, it's 
been doing this for a while. It's just very shocking. It's, 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 it's really great. Um, you know, S3 Select was a technology that we were playing around with, and it really showed us that that if you need non-web web latency, but still things to move very quick, it's a lower cost solution that, than DynamoDB um, uh, or Redis, and you should really look into it. Um, uh, not everything needs to be necessarily web speed. If you can wait a second or two for a response, it's, it's really a great middle ground. Uh, I think Amazon Lambda has been pretty great too. Um, it, it, it essentially, this serverless scaling and this infinite kind of, uh, of, uh, of resource and bandwidth doesn't really uh, allows us not to really worry about things too much. And when a smaller company like us, like I said, we have maybe 110 employees, and we're able to service and provide solutions for the largest uh, healthcare institutions uh, in the world, it, it's really cool to kind of being able to, to, to put a punch above your weight. Um, and then the uh, last but not least is definitely Amazon StageMaker solution. So this has been uh, uh, able to essentially really quickly do big, cool, deep learning stuff. Um, uh, and being able to set up a framework and, and easily, in even a notebook environment, sp uh, spin up and implement these large scale and complex architectures um, and, and train to, you know, really whatever your target variables are. Um, but with that all being said, uh, I just want to thank people for letting me, me speak here, and I'll hand this back off to uh, Jonah. Thank you, Adam and Frank. That was a great presentation. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, we are taking uh, questions right now, and it looks like we have about 15 minutes, so we may end up a little bit early. So if you happen to have a question about anything you heard, go ahead and submit it to that question box. and. I will pass it along to our guests. Um, just to get started, how much of a black box is the data analysis that, that's done on, on the Prognos platform uh, versus how much can clients really dig in to see how the algorithm reached a given conclusion? Because I know that can be a concern with, with AI, especially as a service. Man, uh, great question. Um, Man, let me think how it, it first of all it depends on the client. Um, certain the trade off between interpretability and understanding is often something you have to make when when having very complex models. And when I walk into a client and I say, look, um, here is I trained this really complex, amazing neural network. I used all the data. Look, and here's the prediction. They say why, and then I say, well, here's a vector representation of the data. What does that mean? Um, it can be a challenge, and often how I explain it is I'll say either, look, there are some options we can to really dig what's going in. We can, um, we can fit a simpler model that's easier to understand. Um, we can highlight which neurons potentially are firing more and, and then try to infer that, hey, you know, this may be an important pathway, um, but it's very hard. Um, and so usually you have to prove it with performance. Um, when you deal with, I think, life sciences companies uh, and they care about the why, the neural network approaches don't really land well. Um, you can, you know, even random force or XG boost and be showing feature importance is helpful. You know, that's what we often use in those scenarios. Um, but we don't. We will often go away from a very, very complex model if the client needs to have interpretability. I hope, hope that helps. Great. So here's another question uh, from from our audience. Uh, would you share any ex experiences with PHI and and PII privacy, security, and compliance controls, specifically in the healthcare context? Uh, and, and this person is especially interested in EMR voice transcriptions, speech to text, and natural language programming. So, what what kind um, of yeah yeah? So so yeah. So um, most of our work is de-identified, um, um, meaning um, the the person's name. I think we take several variables: name, first name, last name, date of birth, a couple of their inputs. We pass it to a SoundX algorithm and several ones and create a unique hash. Um, 
And so um, being able to minimize records, yet still being able to link them, um, allows us to do certain things that are no longer PHI, PII. However, we do have also a PHI and PIA business. Um, a couple things to talk about both of those. Um, even though we have data that is PH that is non legally recognized PHI, we treat everything here as PHI, regardless of, of whatever, because the world is imperfect. And the amount of times I've seen a a doctor an anatomical pathology put in their notes, oh Greg from whatever had this. Look, like you know things happen, and we just need to we we have to have controls in place. So there's a lot of things that we do. Um, in, in addition to all the HIPAA uh, certifications that we use, we have a very limited list of technologies that are approved. Uh, Amazon uh, and Databricks have uh, HIPAA compliant PII tech that they support that's, conjured, that's covered under business agreements for protection. Um, we have clean rooms. We have, uh, you know, I think I can't take anything outside of the country, my laptop or my cell phone or whatnot, because it contains this. So there's a lot of rules that we face. We face audits all the time um, from, from different parties. We even have uh, to see if we can catch certain things. So we have um, everything from false spam attacks to um, uh, you know, uh, you know, certain email requests that are tempting to see if employees would violate stuff to, to help catch things. So we test ourselves constantly for these um, with it for, for all compliance uh, stuff. Uh, we don't have any uh, um, uh, voice to text things, but we do have uh, of, um, free text that's entered by clinical and human people. Um, we've developed a lot of scraping algorithms that remove things before people can see that have potential to be PII. Um, um, let's see here if there's anything else in my head. Um, no, I think I see those are the broad shows. I'm to be to be completely fair. I'm, I'm not the full expert on this, um, but we have a, we have many controls and compliance and security in place um, at many different levels. Um, yeah, and, and just to answer from the Databricks side, uh, you know, we we architect our platform on the AWS cloud for optimal security. Um, so our, our platform is HIPAA compliant, and we will do a BAA with uh, you know with companies to make sure that their data is properly covered. Um, with regards to some of the architectures that we see. Um, we, we operate under a principle of, you know, even though the platform's HIPAA compliant, you know, we try to give you as many, as many things, you know, as many hooks as is possible to minimize the exposure surface of PHI. We see this as a strong best practice where, you know, people should be working on de-identified data wherever possible, but if not, that they should be minimizing, you know, minimizing how much data, uh, how much PHI people have access to. In terms of this, um, we do a couple of things that are important. We make it very easy for people to define access controls on any table that they're looking at. So one, uh, one thing that's a key application with this is any table that you have that has PHI in it, you may go ahead and limit access to that table to only the people who are cleared for the needs of that project to access the data. Uh, even further than that, if you have a table that has PHI in some columns but not all, you can actually set an access control list on an individual column in that table so that someone may have access to the, to the um, anonymized or the non-PHI, non-PII columns in that table, but they can't access the, the fields that are sensitive. Um, so we have a number of different security architectures that, uh, that we've deployed that make this very easy for people to go ahead and spin up on their own side. Thank you both. That was a uh, very complete answer, and I appreciate hearing from both the Databricks and the Prognos side. It looks like we are out of questions um, and seeing no more. I think we're going to wrap up a little bit early. So thank you again both so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. I want to just quickly invite our audience to complete the evaluation at the conclusion of today's event and share your thoughts with us. And as a reminder, today's session will be available on demand for one year through the HIMSS Learning Center. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.